Right? Hi everyone, this is Alexander Lim and welcome to Author Story, where on every episode we speak to a different author on a particular topic of interest. On today's episode is Erica Garza, who grew up in a Catholic environment which really should tell you everything about how she was brought up regarding sex. Her book, or rather memoir, is Getting Off, One Woman's Journey Through Sex and Porn Addiction, and you can check it out right now by clicking on the Amazon link in the video description below. So Erica, welcome. Great to have you with us in Author Story. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. So Erica, first off, what made you decide to write Getting Off? There are a few different reasons um, for wanting to write this book. The first and foremost, I have always turned to writing as a way to figure things out in my life and as a source of comfort. I been using writing and writing in journal since I was about seven years old. And whenever a difficult emotion came up for me, I would often turn to the page and get it out of my head and onto paper. So I found it very useful that way, just to gain some perspective throughout my life. Um, so yeah, I started writing just to sort of figure out what was happening with my relationships in regards right. to sex, because I had a hunch that something was off in, right. in the way that I approached sex and in my relationships. Mm. And I also... Um, started writing the book. Well, I, I wrote an essay first in 2014 on the topic, and that was the first time um, I'd written about this particular subject. And it was, as you can imagine, pretty difficult for me. It brought up a lot of emotions. And I decided to publish that online just to sort of see what happened, I guess, right. as a sort of risk. Right. Um, and I received so many emails from people who were just feeling really grateful that I was writing about something that they felt they were feeling all on their own and, and felt really isolated and alone and ashamed in this. Mm. And it was then that I felt like I could contribute in a meaningful way to other people's lives and help other people feel less alone. That yeah. was sort of the second reason for wanting to write this, just to sort of reach out to those people who um, needed help. Right, right. Okay, okay. So, uh, you know, you, you did mention some reasons, but there was like, was there like a single, you know, like an aha moment when you realized, I'm going to write this book? Or was it more of like, you know, it kind of just grew over time? I would say it grew over time. I mean, okay. definitely writing that essay and publishing it and getting that sort of positive response was, was a big part of wanting to take it further to the next step and write a whole book on the subject. And I'd also done something in my recovery from sex addiction called the Hoffman Process, mm -hmm. which is this seven-day retreat. And I write about it in the book. It's a seven-day retreat where you go to, to this isolated retreat center. You, you're cut off from your phones, from internet, from people that you know, mm -hmm. and you work on, you know, looking at your patterns and the negative patterns in your life and how they uh, developed in childhood, how they changed over time. And part of that process was writing a lot. And so I wrote a lot about my past, about my parents, about my patterns and how they got worse and, and you know, what I wanted out of my life going forward, how, what kind of healthier patterns I wanted in my life and doing that kind of work, putting that down on paper and being alone with that kind of history in front of me on the page um, was a great way to just start delving into this sort of work um, outside of that retreat center in, in my regular life. Okay, okay, I got that. All right. So the topic of the book, Getting Off, I mean, this is about your life of uh, sexual addiction. Now, we're more conditioned in general to think of men as being more prone to sex addiction, but yeah, this really isn't the case, is it? It is not the case. You know, that's a misconception people have about sex addiction and not just sex addiction, but sex in general. They, you know, a lot of people think that men want to have sex more than women. Um, you know, men are the only ones really looking at porn. If a woman looks at porn, she's only looking at, you know, this, these really soft, uh, intimate romantic scenes with great lighting and, you know, romance and connection is a big part of it. And they, they don't really think that women can approach uh, sex and porn the same way that a man can. And that's just not the case. And so what I was hoping to do with this book, obviously, is just open up that conversation a little more and show that women can be addicted to porn and watch porn a lot and watch the same kind of porn that men watch mm -hmm. and, you know, can eventually become addicted to sex just the way that I did. And, you know, I said that I received so many messages from people across the world who had read my work and felt like I was speaking to them and speaking about something they'd gone through. And that was from men and women alike. And mm -hmm. I noticed that there wasn't much difference between what men and women were saying. Mm -hmm. It was just that women weren't talking about it publicly the way that many men have. And that 
just adds an extra layer of shame to women. And they already feel ashamed, you know, dealing with this kind of problem, but then being told by our culture that this isn't for them and that there's something right. just wrong with them, right. um, that just adds more, more complexity to it and, and more problems. So I was just hoping to open up that conversation. Mm, right. And uh, definitely, I think, I think, uh, I mean, this is a conversation that needs to be held. I mean, it's, 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 um, an addiction is an addiction and, you know, it's got to be brought out regardless, yes. of, regardless of gender, regardless of anything like that. Right. And a lot of people will say nowadays, still even doctors will say that sex addiction doesn't exist. And I don't think that that is helpful either because, you know, if you are having a problem and you're trying to get help for it and then somebody tells you, well, that's just not a real problem, then what will you do? You'll just end up shutting down. You won't seek help. You'll keep things to yourself. And I don't think that anything fuels addiction more than silence and shame and isolation. And when you're able to speak about these things openly and being held in a safe and supportive space, then you start right. the healing process. Right, right. Okay. Now, when people think of, uh, you know, sex addict, quote unquote, you know, uh, especially for women involved, uh, they, they tend to think of someone who has suffered abuse and trauma. And this really isn't the case all the time, is it? I mean, even particularly with your experience. Right. And that's another misconception about sex addiction that I was trying to um, cut through. I, my, my childhood was very loving, safe. You know, I grew up in a um, safe neighborhood, two-parent home. Oh, they were Catholic, and um, I went to, you know, private schools growing up. I, we took vacations every year. You know, it was a very normal, fulfilling childhood. And I, what I would say, my trauma, I do think that I suffered trauma, but it wasn't sexual trauma. It wasn't abuse. I like to call it ordinary trauma. You know, it wasn't anything that was um, violent or anything like that. When I was 12, I was diagnosed with scoliosis. And so I had to wear a back brace for two years. Mm -hmm. And that was really the beginning of me feeling really self-conscious and not, uh, you know, starting to hate my body mm -hmm. and feel different from other people and insecure. And I had a lot of social anxiety. And the only way that I knew how to cope with those things is I had already started masturbating and sort of exploring porn in a kind of, you know, normal way that kids come across this and they become curious and interested yeah. in it. And I took it to an extreme. So I started using sex and, and or masturbation more and, and porn as escape routes, as a way to cope with these big, scary feelings that came up for me that I didn't know how to deal with in a healthy way, I would start watching more and more porn. I would compulsively masturbate. And that gave me a sort of break for a while from all of those feelings and emotions. Mm, okay. So, so you essentially got started on this road then, um, I know how to put it, to, to, to hide yourself, to get a break, as you mentioned, from, from what you were experiencing then. Yeah. So when I was trying to achieve orgasm, that was all that I had to worry about for those few minutes. You know, mm. I didn't have to worry about what other kids thought of, about me at school. I didn't uh -huh. have to worry about, well, you know, what they might be saying and how I might present myself in a certain way. You know, it was just me and this one tiny goal and everything else, all the chatter in my mind would just sort of die. Mm. And that became, you know, a, a compulsion after a while and a crutch to deal with anything that came up after that. And then later on, you know, and I couldn't have known that I was pursuing this sort of crutch at the same time that the internet was becoming much more sophisticated. So anytime that I may have pulled away from that crutch, then, you know, new websites came out mm -hmm. and, you know, there were chat rooms I could go to. And mm -hmm. then I couldn't just download pictures. I could now download, you know, videos and then mm -hmm. I could have streaming videos. And it all just became much more accessible, higher speeds and harder to pull away from. Mm -hmm. And then later when I started to have sex um, in, in real life, you know, I started to have relationships with men. Then that became another piece to the puzzle. You know, I could I could also go out with men. I could watch porn when I wasn't with a man, you mm -hmm. know, and I had just, just had this endless resource um, to, to match this growing habit. Mm -hmm. And I find it in a little bit interesting that you would have a uh, sex with men because, I mean, um, having sex requires, uh, you know, you're, you're intimate with the other person, yet you started off on this road using sex, well, masturbation, to hide from, you know, these, these emotions. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even when I was having sex with men, I still felt like I was hiding, you know, mm -hmm. flirting 
and sex, those could be much easier. Those, those felt much easier to me than making conversations or building friendships and actually being intimate and connecting. There's a way to have sex without actually connecting. It always felt like there was a wall up between us. We weren't actually, we weren't having these deep, beautiful conversations with each other. It was just right. talking about getting to the next part, which was sex. Let's, let's get to the bedroom. I would often, you know, when meeting a person, just wait till we got to that part that I wanted to get to, which was in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know, and I felt very lonely in a lot of those relationships. And when I did feel myself connecting with people, I did have relationships, you know, throughout my life. Right. When I, when it all got too serious, when I felt myself caring too much or being cared for, then I would make sure to sabotage a relationship and get away from it very quickly because that all felt much too scary and much too risky. It was much easier to keep things casual. Mm, okay. Okay. Got that. All right. Interesting. Interesting viewpoint there. Okay. All right. So as you mentioned in your book, sexual addiction is a, it's a bit of a vague concept. Um, so, you know, from your definition, what is a sex addict? Is this someone who like watches, looks at porn sites uh, for eight hours a day, every day, or is there something more to this than that? Oh, sex addiction can't really be measured that way. You know, people often ask me, what's too much porn? You know, is yes, five hours yes. of porn okay, but yes. is six taking it too far? And I think it's going to manifest differently in every person. I think that the best way to look at it is if is to ask yourself that question. Am I using sex as a way to escape from problems in my life? Am I using sex in a destructive way? Am I putting myself into situations um, that I feel like I can't control? Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about asking yourself those questions. And you can have a pretty good idea when you really look at and examine how you're using sex and how you are in your relationships if you're doing things in an unhealthy way that isn't serving yourself or serving other people. But I can't really define it for every mm -hmm. person. Some person might be addicted to watching you know, porn all day, or they might not watch porn and they just like having lots of casual relationships and unsafe sex. And they feel mm -hmm. like they can't control that part. They might like cheating on their spouse. You know, mm -hmm. it could manifest in a lot of different ways. Um, and for me, the way that it manifested was in watching excessive amounts of porn. Um, so I would, I would spend a lot of time watching it and also more and more extreme porn because I couldn't really uh, I became desensitized to like certain kind of porn. So I had to go after really hardcore porn, porn that made me feel really bad and, and disgusted almost. Mm -hmm. I would um, seek out relationships that were really casual and unsafe and even, you know, relationships where I felt quite used and, um, you know, men didn't treat me very kindly and I didn't treat other people kindly. So I was always looking for this element of shame and the kind of porn mm -hmm. I watched and the kind of relationships I sought. Shame was driving force of the way my addiction manifested. I needed to feel turned off and bad and used in order to feel that rush of adrenaline that came with the sexual experience. That's the way it manifested for me. I see. Okay. Okay. So what is the impact on you? I mean, I mean, you already spoke a little bit about this, but what is the impact of uh, your sex addiction on yourself? I would say that isolation was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really, you know, uh, pursuing relationships in which I felt valued or where I valued another person. I didn't feel connected to other people around me. I would sabotage relationships that were meaningful and that I cared for. Mm -hmm. um, I also put myself into some destructive situations where I felt quite unsafe with people who made me feel unloved and, uh, and not valuable. Um, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, watching porn to the point where I didn't I wasn't productive in area, other areas of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that those are the biggest, the biggest parts. And just also a general feeling of shame that I carried mm -hmm. around with me for a really long time and worthlessness and self-hatred and self-loathing. I mean, those kind of things didn't just exist in the bed room, but, you know, outside of my life, just the way that I carried myself through the world, I didn't feel worthy of good things in my life because I was so often feeling bad about myself. Right, right. And what is the impact of sex addiction on, sorry, sex addiction on the people around you? People probably just felt neglected and mm -hmm. like they didn't mean anything to me. They weren't worth my time. You know, mm -hmm. I would just often disconnected from other people. Um, I would make plans and then break them because I would find, you know, somebody to have sex with, or I right. would much rather stay home and feed my habits instead right. of going out and, and actually interacting with people. So even with your family? 
Yeah, even with my family. Wow. Sure. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So, uh, wow. <laughs> This this is this is heavy stuff. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, but a lot of people are going through it, you know, and I think a lot of people would be able to understand. Mm -hmm. Um, even if they are not addicts, I think that a lot of people would be able to relate to a feeling of getting lost in a certain kind of feeling or in certain kind of habits that don't really serve them and they feel sort of stuck. I think that the feeling of being stuck is a is a big part of this story of mine. Okay, so uh, have you? I'm just curious. Have you spoken with other uh, female sex addicts or former female former sex addicts like yourself? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, like after, I said, after I wrote the book or even wrote the essay, so many women reached out to me and um, had gone through the same thing. Mm. And also, when you go to twelve step meetings, is another great community of support um, where you can meet a lot of other people who have gone through the same situations. Right, right. So. Was your experience similar to yours? I mean, I'm just asking. Was it? Was there experience similar to yours, or were there di like different drivers to their behavior? Oh, there are a lot of different reasons why people, why people end up in this sort of situation. You know, I mean, I sure I've met people who had similar experiences, but everybody has a different life experience. You know, so so there are different reasons. Of course, there have been people who have suffered abuse growing up. There uh -huh. are people who had, you know, assault happen to them. You know, there's a lot of different ways and, and reasons. We all have different lives. Right. So. Okay. Okay. I got that. So um, I, I just want to do a little sidetrack here because, uh, I mean, uh, I'm sure a lot of our listeners, you know, they're, they're thinking, you know, porn has something to do with this. Uh, you know, if, if we got rid of all porn, you know, there would be no such thing as sex addiction and that kind of, that kind of, you know, uh, those kinds of remarks. But mm -hmm. uh, porn is not, from, from what's coming out here, porn is not really the cause of sex addiction, sex addiction or anything like that, is it? I mean, it's... No, like, I yeah. would not say, yeah, I'm... Definitely, 100%. I'm I'm not anti-porn. You know, I I still watch porn, which people find surprising after reading my story. You know, I say that in the end of the book. I, every once in a while, I do watch porn, but I don't watch it now because I need to or mm -hmm. because I'm trying to escape something. I watch it because I want to and because mm -hmm. sometimes I enjoy it. But it took me a while to get to that point. You know, it's a process. At the beginning of my recovery, I thought. You know, I could never watch porn again. Mm -hmm. I could never have sex outside of, the, you know, the strict bounds of my monogamous relationship. And I set myself a lot of boundaries and um, it started to feel, well, I should say that was helpful in the beginning because it helped to interrupt my patterns right. and it helped me feel the feelings I was trying to escape and right. deal with them in a productive way. So I think that taking a break from any kind of pattern that you've been wrapped up in is, is helpful for anyone. But after a while, that started to feel, it started to feel inauthentic to me. And I realized then that, you know, I still wanted to be an experimental, open-minded sexual person, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to hurt the people that I loved. I didn't want to hurt myself. Right. I didn't want to feel bad all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was much more about overcoming the shame that I'd long attached to my sexual behaviors than getting rid of all of those sexual behaviors. Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't the answer. It was more about finding moderation and balance. And so I don't think that if you took away porn, that all of a sudden sex addiction would be would be solved, you know, right, right. there would be different ways of acting out, right? You can start going to strip clubs and then what you have to ban strip clubs and then you can go to right. peep shows or, you know, there's, there could be anything, you know, I mean, it manifests differently for every person. I think it's more about looking at what you're trying to escape. And for me, it was trying to escape that trauma that happened, that ordinary trauma that happened when I was 12 years old. That's feeling insecure, feeling self-conscious, feeling like I'm unworthy of other people's love, mm -hmm. um, feeling that I should be unseen. You know, there's mm -hmm. something wrong with my body, learning how to deal with those feelings in a productive way instead of escaping them because I'd been escaping those feelings and dealing with those feelings for so long by using porn and using sex as coping mechanisms. So how can I deal with those feelings in a different way? How can I go to those feelings, talk about them, talk about how I feel, um, not hide, not escape, face those feelings? It's, it's working through those sort of processes that helped me work, you know, do the work that I needed to do, not just stop watching porn, because all of those feelings would have still been there. You know, it was having to deal with that trauma and, and those things that happened that helped in the end. All right. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Got that. So, all right. Cool. Interesting. So, uh, all right. Got that. 
So, uh, Erica, let's say you came across someone who may or may not realize they're sexually addicted, and you had only enough time to tell that person one thing. What would be that one thing you tell that person? I would say, find somebody to talk to. And so mm -hmm. if they're talking to me, then I would say, you know, well, I would I would recommend that they go to a 12-step meeting, actually, because then they'll mm -hmm. find a lot more people with a lot of different stories instead of just my story alone, which they may or may not relate to. Right. I always tell people who come to me looking for help, have you tried a 12-step meeting? Because when you go to a 12-step meeting, it's a great way to just find a lot of like-minded people. And it's a space where you can feel safe in talking about things that you may have kept hidden for a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, so th that would be my first recommendation for support. But certainly talking about it, you know, being able to reveal parts of yourself and parts of your past is a huge help. You know, so much of addiction is about being isolated and secretive and feeling ashamed and feeling like you can't say these difficult truths to other people. Mm. Um, so being able to let that guard down and reveal those things is a great first step. Mm. Okay, I got that. All right, very interesting. Now let me move on a little bit to something else, Erica, because I know on this, in this author story interview series, I've had occasion to um, also interview um, people who are addicted to drugs and uh, alcohol and stuff like that. And the commonality with them is that they hit rock bottom and where they realize, you know, things have got to change. Uh, now, speaking from your experience as a sex addict, did you have any similar experience? I did not hit rock bottom. People okay. often ask me that, you know, yes. and it's difficult for me to find one moment. It was more of a gradual realization, almost mm -hmm. like a voice in my head that was telling me I had a problem, but the voice just kept getting louder and louder until I had to listen to it finally. Right. And so I was in my late 20s and I'd sabotaged yet another relationship and one that was starting to be particularly meaningful to me and you know, with a person that I cared about. And I left that person for no good reason other than the fact that I didn't feel worthy of it. I didn't feel mm -hmm. worthy of any kind of good, positive thing in my life. Right. And I knew that, you know, and it became hard to ignore that truth. And so I felt, okay, you know, and I looked at my life and, and saw this pattern. And I said, okay, well, something has to change here. Also, I'm going to be on the same path. And my 30th birthday was coming up. Mm -hmm. And it felt like a good opportunity to just do things differently. And I just mm -hmm. read the book, Eat, Pray, Love. So I was pretty much inspired by that to go to Bali. Okay. And it was in Bali that I went there and I had this intention to just do things differently, take care of myself, pay attention to what was happening in my head and start to imagine a different way of living my life in a more positive and meaningful way. Okay. So uh, what, what do you say is the, uh, would be the, the uh, most important practice for you when, when, it came to, when it came to recovering from your addiction? Oh, just telling the truth, having mm -hmm. somebody to speak to, to be honest and raw and vulnerable with. I mean, I think vulnerability is one of the greatest strengths that we can have. And it was only until I started revealing to other human being, and it happened to be the, the man who became my husband, but you don't have to find a room. I don't want this to be like, my husband saved me. Right, right, right. You know, I mean, you can find that that sort of space to be vulnerable with a friend or with a family member or mm. with a therapist or, you know, whoever it may be. For me, it happened to be the, the man that I married. Um, but it was the first person that I told, look, I think I have a problem with sex addiction, porn addiction. Here's what's been happening in my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to reveal something like that to somebody, it's it takes a, a lot of courage. And so... I, but it was the most important thing I could have done because he didn't run away. And he said, you know, I'll listen to you. I'll, I'll embrace you no matter what you're going through. Let's talk about it. Let's work through it. And it wasn't until I revealed that that I really started to gain some perspective on what was happening in my life and, you know, the patterns that I'd been stuck in. And that's when I started to really shift in the right direction and start going to 12-step meetings. I started doing a lot of meditation and yoga and writing about my journey. I did you know, talk therapy and just trying to do all of the things differently and work on my issues that I had been running away from for a long time. Mm, okay. Okay. Got that. Okay, cool. So Erica, in the last minute or so of this interview, are there any last words of wisdom you'd like to share to inspire our listeners? I would just love to tell people who may be struggling with this, that you're not alone. Um, you know, you're not worthless, you're not unlovable, that there are other people out there who have dealt with this, who are dealing with this, and that there is a road to recovery. And also to not be afraid of trying a lot of different uh, ways out of it. You know, a lot of people think that it's either you find God 
or you go to a 12 step meeting and that's it. And then they may try those things and they don't particularly work for them. And so then they give up and they just go back to what they were doing before. Um, but like I tried to say before, I tried a lot of different methods, yoga, meditation, talk therapy. I did that Hoffman process writing, 12-step meetings, you know, a lot of different things you can try. Mm -hmm. And I was often looking for the one solution, not realizing that it was the combination of those efforts that ended up working in the end. Mm, okay, I got that. Well, uh, great words of wisdom right there. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I'm sure people pick up a lot from that. So I hope so. Yeah. So in closing then, the book is Getting Off, One Woman's Journey Through Sex and Porn Addiction. The authors are guest, Erica Garza. And yeah, you can find her book on Amazon. So Erica, thank you very much for being an author story. Thank you very much for revealing a, um, a topic that I, that really should be more openly discussed. <laughs> I agree. Thank you so much for ha having me. Yeah, you're welcome. So everyone, I invite you all to check out Getting Off. And of course, please feel free to subscribe to our channel. So catch you all next time on Author Story Weekly Interviews with another amazing topic and another awesome author.